Okay, well, let's go ahead and get things started. We have some folks still joining, but uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, start moving. They'll join with us uh, as soon as they can. Welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this month's webinar. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, appreciate your time. And um, I think you're going to find today's session certainly interesting, if not intriguing, but we'll uh, cover a number of different topics. Today's, uh, the subject of today's webinar is uh, five tips for effective direct access implementation and management. And before we get started and, and diving into the meat of the, uh, the session, I want to go over a couple of things. Brief introduction about myself, for those of you who don't know me. My name is Richard Nix, and I'm the Director of Technical Services for Celestix Networks. I am a Microsoft Most Valuable uh, Professional, an MVP in the Enterprise Security Discipline. Um, I have your standard assortment of Microsoft certifications. Uh, I've been in the business for quite some time, uh, spent about the last uh, 20 years um, doing network and information security, specifically centered around Microsoft Edge Security and Remote Access. A little bit about Celestix Networks. Um, Celestix has been around for quite some time, actually started business originally in 1999, uh, so we've been in business quite some time. Um, uh, our original product set was centered around uh, developing OEM solutions for checkpoints. We built checkpoint uh, hardware firewalls. Um, had a number, uh, a number of uh, different OEM partnerships with a variety of security uh, uh, companies that you probably are familiar with. For example, RSA, Surf Control, WebSense, uh, BNC, a variety of others as well. Uh, Celestix does have a global footprint. We do have offices, uh, headquarters is, uh, in uh, the U.S., actually Northern California is the corporate headquarters. The, uh, we do have offices in uh, Europe, uh, UK, um, yeah, Asia Pacific region as well. We have uh, countless customers through a wide variety of um, just about all verticals you can imagine. And our solutions are available from, uh, again, a variety of, of different uh, partners, retailers, distributors, uh, uh, distributors, uh, distributors, excuse me, in your region. So you can, it's, it's pretty easy to find our solutions. So today, again, pressing on, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, five essential tips for uh, effective direct access implementation and management, plus a bonus tip. And that bonus tip uh, is because I'm OCD and I wanted this slide to be <laughs> uh, even. Anyway, just kidding. Uh, today we're going to talk about a variety of things uh, centered around the deployment uh, of direct access. I want to share with you some things, uh, some tips about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about client provisioning and high availability for the overall solution. I also want to touch upon remote administration and not remote, uh, not remote administration in the sense that we want to manage or remotely manage our Windows desktops or our connected direct access clients. But I'm more specifically talking about performing corporate network uh, administration remotely from a connected direct access client. So we're going to turn that around. Uh, and the way you do that is a little bit different. So I'm going to share with you some tips on that. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with uh, some tips on session management and direct access client troubleshooting. So let's move on and uh, we'll touch base on my first tip for direct access deployments. And that tip is to plan thoroughly. I, I can't state this enough. Um, uh, planning is absolutely the key uh, and an essential and vital component to a direct access deployment. Um, direct access is uh, pretty complex, has a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of different uh, deployment scenarios and optional configurations, and all of those uh, can quickly get out of hand and if you don't plan for them accordingly. Uh, I will share with you uh, from personal experience for customers that engage with Celestix but jump ahead of us and without having a planning and design session, uh, you can quickly find yourself taking paths uh, that are not going to be uh, the, the, the most optimal. Uh, you, uh, for those customers that have engaged with Celestix after a failed direct access deployment or one that perhaps um, uh, was not as highly successful, certainly the lack of planning uh, is, is, typically, is typically to blame there. So plan thoroughly, that's, that's probably our biggest tip. There are a variety of design considerations that you have to make uh, when you're talking about doing a planning and design uh, solution uh, scenario. Um, Chief among those, and of course there's myriad of them, I'm just going to talk about two real important ones right now, and that's the network configuration and the supported clients for your direct access deployment. Um, again, myriad of different things that you can uh, consider when you're, when you're talking about uh, designing a direct access architecture. But two of the main ones, the network configuration and the supported clients, the two of those will have a tremendous impact 
uh, and bearing on your overall design. There's uh, tons more than that, but I think that's a, a couple of uh, key ones. In terms of supporting infrastructure, uh, direct access relies heavily on PKI and Active Directory, and it's important to have those conversations and understand what those specific requirements are. Also not shown on the slide and vitally important is the network location server. There's uh, a number of different gotchas there. And from an implementation perspective, we need to plan uh, for security groups and group policy objects because we're going to rely heavily on both of those things to um, do some of the things that we need to do for direct access. Direct access fundamentally is implemented via the use of group policy objects. All of the settings for the client and the server are handled by uh, Active Directory group policy objects. So that is obviously uh, critical to uh, the planning phase. So uh, let's talk a little bit about client provisioning. I think one of the hallmarks of direct access is that it is uh, just really easy to use and very simple. No reason not to make that even more simple for the administrators by automating client provisioning. And automating as much as you can for everything. We'll talk about a number of different things we can automate, for example. Uh, chief among those certificate plug, uh, we suggest and recommend, highly recommend, creating an automated deployment for the, uh, your certificates for not only your direct access clients but the direct access servers at, as well. So from a client perspective, it's important that uh, we ease the operational uh, overhead for deploying uh, direct access and provisioning direct access clients <coughs> excuse me, by um, automating the certificate deployments so that when they are placed, when a direct access computer account is placed in a security group, they automatically get not only the direct access settings, but the necessary certificates for that as well. So we can get them the certificates they need. In addition, when you deploy additional direct access servers, again, it makes the, the configuration, the administration much easier. If you put the server in a security group, that automatically gets the, the, the IPsec, uh, or excuse me, the machine certificates required for IPsec on the server side as well. And most importantly, in terms of automated certificate deployment for clients and servers, um, these certificates are going to expire at some point. Uh, when they expire uh, on the client side, um, that's fairly painful. When it expires on the server side, obviously you have a system-wide outage and nobody's going to be able to connect. We want you to automate that so we can eliminate that kind of a pain point so that when those certificates do expire, they will renew automatically and everything will just work and be happy and there's uh, you know, no pages going off, weekends and so forth. It's definitely a, definitely the, uh, a positive way to go. Um, you can also automate the optional client configuration component so there's a variety of different settings that can also be automated for direct access clients uh, in terms of, uh, for example, disabling IPv6 transition protocols that are not in use, uh, things like 6 to 4 and ISOTAP, uh, Teredo if you're deploying direct access behind a uh, border router or edge device performing NAT. If you're doing manage out, if your scenario supports manage out, you're going to need to change the default firewall uh, rule settings on direct access clients and those can be all configured and managed through Active Directory Group Policy so you can automate all of that stuff. And then finally, uh, and this is specific to Windows 7 clients, uh, the DCA or the Direct Access Connectivity Assistant, you can automate via uh, Active Directory Group Policy, you can automate the installation of the client software and the configuration setting for the DCA as well. Again. Uh, automate all those things, uh, your, uh, the, your life will be much easier, much simpler. Provisioning a direct access client will be as easy as dropping them into a uh, security group. Provisioning a direct access server will be as easy as dropping it into a security group and then going through the, um, um, the management console to add that server or just simply executing some PowerShell commands as well. Uh, next tip centers around uh, high availability and, and uh, any time you have a solution like this for any organization of appreciable size, uh, high availability is key and the tip here is obviously to look for and uh, eliminate any single points of failure in your architecture and your design. And here is where uh, when you engage with Celestix, this is uh, one of our value adds and our value propositions is that we've been deploying direct access for many, many years, more than five years now. We deploy direct access on a nearly daily basis, and we've deployed direct access for some of the largest organizations in the world. Um, we're keenly aware of all of the uh, 
all of the areas that you can get tripped up and have single points of failure where you might not think you do. So again, if you engage with Celestics, we can assist you there either uh, on a pre-sales engagement, doing a design, a planning a design session, or from a professional services standpoint, you can engage with us uh, to help you and assist you there. Some uh, possible failure points and real common failure points obviously are the direct access server. If you have one and it goes offline, either planned or unplanned, uh, it's going to be challenging, right? So um, again, if you have an organization of any real size, uh, this can be potentially challenging, especially if you take it down to even for a planned outage, for example, and you you install an update and maybe it goes sideways or it doesn't want to start or who knows what. Um, could be something totally unrelated to the direct access server. Maybe a PDU fails, perhaps a switch outage, uh, switch configuration again went sideways and there's a problem. So we might have some challenges there. We can address that by implementing load balancing for the direct access server and create clusters or arrays of direct access servers that are function as an active, active cluster. You can have up to uh, eight nodes using integrated load balancing. You can have as many, I think, as 32, if I'm not mistaken, if you're using an external uh, load balancer. Uh, integrated network load balancing is part of the base product, and, and it's obviously free. Uh, it does work. It is effective, um, somewhat limited. We do recommend for larger deployments that you use an external load balancer for a variety of reasons, uh, and there are some excellent solutions out there. F5 is, is probably, in fact, a standard when you're talking about uh, load balancing, hardware load balancing solutions. Uh, the F5 local traffic manager is an excellent enterprise solution. Um, don't forget about uh, the folks at Kemp. Uh, Kemp Technologies have a product called the Loadmaster Load Balancer, which is uh, quite not as uh, not, not quite as feature rich as the F5, but it is an outstanding solution. It does provide very effective load balancing in a variety of platforms: hardware, software, virtual, what have you, uh, and very cost effective. In addition. Uh, I personally wrote the direct access implementation guide for the Kemp Loadmaster in a direct access deployment scenario. So if you're interested in, in that, just drop me a note uh, after the session. I'd be happy to send you that link. Um, another uh, failure point, obviously, that can be addressed is uh, geographic redundancy. So for large organizations that have uh, multiple uh, data centers or physical locations, you can distribute uh, direct access servers to each of those uh, data centers in, to support geographic redundancy. That's called a multi-site deployment. You can enhance the um, resiliency and uh, provide a little more granular and a little more accurate uh, load balancing by using GSLP. So it supports uh, a global server load balancer. Again, the F5 uh, has that capability through the global traffic manager module. Um, the uh, Kemp Load Master solution has a, a feature called Geo that provides that as well. Um, so be sure to look into those. Uh, those can definitely make a uh, multi-site deployment uh, much more resilient. And then finally, the network location server. The, the, the network location server in the LLS is a rather innocuous uh, infrastructure component that gets often overlooked until it's not available, and then it causes a significant and substantial amount of pain. So uh, we recommend that you make the NLS highly available in some fashion. Um, we have customers who, and, and again, for those of you who may not be familiar with the NLS, that's nothing more than a web server that uh, resides on your internal corporate network. The direct access clients use that to determine whether they are inside or outside of the corporate network. If they can connect to it successfully, they are inside the network. If they cannot, they will attempt to establish remote corporate network connectivity using direct access. If the NLS is offline and those clients are internal, they will believe they're outside, attempt to connect via direct access, and things go from, you know, it, things are bad if it works and it goes to worse, obviously, if it doesn't work. So it's, there's some real challenges there. So we, we recommend you make it highly available. For some organizations, uh, highly available means that I'm running it uh, as a virtual machine on a uh, highly available or redundant uh, clustered Hyper-V host or VMware host. The challenge with that is that um, that works sufficiently if there is a host issue, but if there is a guest issue, for example, the IIS service doesn't start, or doesn't run, what have you, um, the failing it over to another host in the cluster is not going to help you. We recommend that you deploy a minimum of two direct access servers. It can be IIS. It can be any web server that responds uh, to uh, HTTP requests. It can actually even be your load balancer. So uh, both the F5 and uh, the load master do support uh, uh, configuration 
as the network location server itself. So as long as those solutions are deployed in highly available clusters, you can actually leverage it for your network location server. And then finally, um, an important and often overlooked uh, component of the network location server is geographic redundancy. So um, it's not supported natively, but there are some uh, clever workarounds to make it geographically redundant. If you have questions about how to do that, I'd be happy to answer those for you either after the call or send you some information on it uh, after the meeting as well. So let's talk a little bit about remote administration, and this is, uh, again, as I mentioned at the outset, not necessarily remote administration of connected direct access clients, I'm more talking about um, the remote corporate network administration from a connected direct access client. The use case here or the demonstration that I'm going to show you is one where I, as a network administrator, have a corporate-issued laptop that has direct access, and I need to perform some administration of my corporate network. I'm going to connect to a router or switch, and to do that on a direct access client is just a little bit different, so I'm going to demonstrate that for you right now. So here, um, let me open up a uh, command. And the first thing I want to demonstrate here is just uh, talking to some internal resources. So I'll ping my uh, application server. And again, as a network engineer or a network administrator, I perhaps want to perform some administration on a uh, uh, network device. Um, so I would probably, and again, I, one of the tools that I use very commonly, and this is probably one of the most common, is PuTTY. So uh, let's see, I'm going to use PuTTY, and I will just provide my IP address. Uh, this is the um, uh, this is the IP address of a uh, router or switch on my network, and I will try to connect to it. And as you'll see, and as you probably well know, uh, it's not going to work. And the reason it doesn't work is because I specified an IPv4 address. Um, if you have any familiarity at all with direct access, you'll understand that it is an IPv6 only solution. So we must supply IPv6 addresses now. Uh, the challenge for us is that, uh, and of course this is very simple, if the host name of this uh, particular device is in DNS, I would just simply choose to uh, connect to it, putty slash hostname, or putty space hostname. And, and that's recommended, I mean, and for very large environments that, that may be challenging, but uh, for direct access and ultimately for uh, IPv6, which is coming, <laughs> it is the way of the future, it is coming, uh, probably need to prepare now. Uh, we need to get the names of our network devices in corporate DNS uh, with a, uh, uh, IPv4 a resource records. Does not require an IPv6 record, quad A record. You can just simply use an IPv4 address. The direct access server will convert it to an IPv6 address as you see here. Now, if, for example, this was again in, uh, in DNS, I would just uh, uh, connect to the host name, all would be good. But in this case, I want to demonstrate how to connect to it if you don't have the host name in DNS. There's no DNS record for this. By the way, you cannot use the local hosts file. If you think you can do this via hosts, uh, it will not work um, unless you put this IPv6 address in here. But we need to determine what that is, and I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. So this particular uh, resource, App1, is on our corporate network, and you'll see it has an IPv6 address here. So let's take a look at this. Uh, this IPv6 address is made up of a prefix, and that prefix is highlighted here. This is the <coughs> corporate IPv6 prefix, followed by uh, this section here that's highlighted, which is our IPv4 address of the resource, the IPv4 address that belongs to App1 in hexadecimal format. So AC10 is actually 172.16.1 whatever CA is. So let's take a look at this real quick. we will show you how to do this. Uh, we'll open up the calculator, Windows calculator, uh, click view and go to programmer. And in this case, we'll input the uh, hexadecimal, which is CA, and we'll select decimal, which converts that to uh, decimal, which is 202. So this is 172.16.1.202. If I want to connect to dot .254, I just simply need to enter that address here. Oops. and then convert it to hex. So it is FE. Great, so it's 1FE. By the way, 
this is technically 0, 1 FE, so 0, 1 being hex for 1. Uh, however, uh, in IPv6 you can eliminate leading zeros, so it basically is 1 FE. So let's see if we can connect to this. We'll just start by pinging it. And that's uh, FE, not F3. <laughs> My bad. And there we go. So we can uh, get a reply. So now let's see if we are able to administer this device. Excellent. Outstanding. So there I am. I'm um, administering this device, uh, and I was able to kind of uh, determine or surmise its IPv6 address um, and then uh, be able to administer that remotely. So if you're performing network administration, you try to connect to an IPv4 address, not going to happen. You have to use its IPv6 address. As you can see, this might be kind of painful uh, doing this one off. Uh, again, the recommendation here is to update corporate DNS, assign names to all your devices, and put those records in DNS. It doesn't have to be IPv6 address, just has to be the IPv4 address with an A host record, <clears throat> and the direct access server will do the conversion process for you. So the next tip, uh, let's talk a little bit about session management in direct access. And for this, we're actually going to use some new features and capabilities that are part of the Celestix E-Series uh, Cloud Edge Security Plans. So let's jump back over to my uh, workstation here. We can close these out. And in this case, uh, we'll open the management console. So this is the Comet uh, web-based management console that's a part of the Celestix E series. Here what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to the remote access dashboard. And uh, I'm, in this case I, I have a scenario in which I have a malware infected client that I need to uh, disconnect their session. They're connected. Uh, my IDS IPS is identifying some malicious traffic from them. I need to prevent them from accessing the corporate network and ultimately remediate this uh, laptop. So I'm going to select uh, the active or current users. I'm going to identify a client here. Let's see. Um, client 3 is, I think, the one I want to look at. So I'm going to highlight that connection. And you'll see I have some details for the connection here, and I have three options. I can reset the connection. I can disable it or I can remove it. Resetting the connection does just that. It basically terminates the direct access um, IPsec security associations, the direct access tunnels, if you will. Uh, disconnects them. The client just simply reconnects. This is helpful for uh, scenarios in which I'm doing some troubleshooting uh, and so forth. That might be helpful. Um, if I select disable, this actually disables the client. Uh, it, it actually disables its uh, Active Directory computer account and then terminates its uh, direct access tunnels. The direct access client will then try to reestablish that connection, but it will not be able to because its uh, computer account will be disabled, so it won't be able to fully authenticate. That prevents it from uh, accessing the, the network. And then remove is kind of the nuclear option. This is something you would use if you have a fully compromised laptop uh, or lost or stolen device and you don't expect it back. You can just simply remove that. That uh, removes or deletes the uh, Active Directory account permanently and then uh, dis, uh, uh, disconnects those tunnels so uh, they won't be able to connect. So again, don't use that one for your day-to-day -day administration unless you plan to uh, uh, either rejoin the computer to the domain or wipe and reload, but that, that's kind of what that's for. So let's take a look at a client, uh, for example, here. This is a, uh, actually, let me go to the command prompt. Um, let's make sure that this is uh, host name. Should be client three, great. And I have a public IPv4 address. I can talk to some resources there. And I can get to my corporate application server. Great. Okay. For example, and in, in, in this scenario, let's say client three has some malicious software and I want to uh, disable it temporarily. So I'll go here to disable. Disable host, click apply. I should get a message here telling me, correct, so client three has been disabled. Outstanding. So now if I come back to this client and attempt to talk to these uh, same resources, you'll see that um, that's no longer work. And that should time out here shortly. And actually if we try to access that same internal intranet site, 
there you have it, page can't be displayed. So I've effectively disconnected uh, this particular host. Uh, I can uh, perform some sort of malware remediation, and once it's uh, once it's um, uh, once it's been remediated, I can uh, very easily just re-enable its Active Directory computer account, and it will um, just automatically and transparently establish uh, direct access to uh, corporate network connectivity. Final and bonus tip for today, and I apologize, we're running up against our uh, time, so I'll, I'll try to make this quick, is uh, performing direct access client troubleshooting. And again, I want to demonstrate this. Uh, once again, this uses a feature, a new feature of the uh, Comet uh, web-based management interface, which is a part of the uh, Celestix E-series of clients. Uh, to do that, what I would do is I would, as a direct access client who's connected remotely, which I believe this one is, I am, yes, right, so I'm connected remotely. Um, effectively, what I'm doing as an administrator is I'm actually clicking on this link, but uh, you would not make this, you would actually make this specific link available to your uh, users. You'd publish that using your existing reverse proxy uh, or something else uh, and, and grant users access to that. But a user uh, uh, would actually, if they're having trouble with uh, direct access connectivity, you and as administrator would send them this link. They would click on this link. And what that link does is, uh, actually this is the, this is the uh, URL you would publish. When the user clicks on the, uh, on the test runner, what they will do is run this file and uh, the test runner actually downloads the direct access client troubleshooting tool from Microsoft, executes all the tests, and, and then uh, outputs that uh, uh, the diagnostic logs uh, to a format uh, that's readable. Obviously, it's just a text log file, and it securely uploads that to the appliance. This stimulates, uh, uh, streamlines the um, uh, troubleshooting of direct access clients, makes it infinitely easier for you as an administrator to conduct this because you can just give the user a link, they click on the link and run this, and then the uh, access logs or these uh, troubleshooting logs, these debug logs, will actually uh, show up on the direct access, uh, in the direct access management console. And from there, you can uh, go through those and sort through them. Um, so as soon as the test runs, we'll take a look at that. So finish the test. So uh, you as the administrator would then come back to the management console and you would see that there is uh, a log. If you just select this, uh, this information is here available for you to look at. And of course you can um, you know, peruse these logs looking for uh, issues as to why I might be uh, struggling to connect. You can actually download this so you can save this as a text file so you can take it off box or import it into another tool if you like. But this greatly streamlines your direct access client troubleshooting and can really save you a lot of time uh, and a lot of uh, effort and uh, agony sometimes. <laughs> anyway, that brings us to the end of the session. Do I do appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we have a few minutes or not a lot of time for questions, but if anyone has any questions at all, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Um, there is a question uh, section in the uh, uh, go to meeting software there. So if you'll select uh, that and then uh, send that question to me, I'd be happy to answer that for you. All right then. No questions today. No problem. Well, I would say that uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and send those to me after uh, something comes up. If you have any questions at all, um, visit Celestix.com slash edge. That is where you can find all the information that you'll need regarding the Celestix E-Series appliance uh, platform. If you have questions uh, regarding our products, uh, regarding our solutions, services, or any technical questions for me, drop a note to sales at Celestix.com. And if it's a technical question, they will just route that to me. I'll be happy to respond, and I'll respond as soon as I can. I appreciate your time, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar. I look forward to speaking with everyone again next month. Thanks again.